All right. Nope. Good morning. Oh, it's a mistake in the first slide. Uh, because today we're going to talk about uh, probabilistic models too. One we had a few weeks ago. Um, yeah, before I get started with the uh, uh, stuff, uh, just a very quick reminder that, um, well, not a lot of people here today, but um, today is the deadline to announce your project uh, subject. So um, you should uh, pick a subject today and put it online, put it on the uh, open a discussion page on your group discussion board. So each group has a home page on Canvas which has a discussion board. You open a discussion page there and you put your sub describe your subject in there in a few sentences. Um, you are allowed to deviate once you start going, get going and um, turns out something else is slightly more interesting or a slightly different way of doing it uh, w works better, that's fine. Um, but we want you to, uh, if not commit, to at least state a subject now so that you have a direction now. So please do that today. Uh, it's only a few sentences and it will hurt your grade if you don't do it. Um, but given that most people aren't here today, I uh, might send an announcement as well, just in case. Okay, that's all the admin. Uh, let's talk uh, probabilities. This is our plan for today. Uh, I'm going to do sort of the same thing uh, to start with that we did on Monday. So we're going to review some things we know already that are very important, that are our basic building blocks. Uh, so on Monday it was this um, linear function that was a very important building block in probabil probability, uh, probabilistic models. It's the normal distribution, which is going to be an important building block in this lecture and the lectures to come. So we're going to go over that a little bit uh, in a little bit more detail than we have so far, just to see if we can give you uh, give you a little intuition for that, or a little more intuition. So that's part one. Then, and this is kind of review as well, we're going to go over this maximum likelihood principle. which we've already seen in the previous lecture, previous uh, probabilistic models lecture. Uh, but I haven't really discussed it properly. I haven't really mentioned what it does and shows, shown how it works. That should put us into the break. And then we're going to look at something new, which is called the Gaussian mixture model. Which I sort of hinted at in the opening uh, lecture, the introduction lecture is basically what you use when one normal distribution doesn't quite fit your data, but a couple of normal distributions together might give you the correct shape of your data. That's called a Gaussian mixture model. You mix a couple of Gaussians together. Gaussian, as you can see there, is a, a synonym for normal distribution. Uh, which is a very nice model, very useful model. The problem is um, it's a bit more difficult to fit than most probability models. So what we need to do that is something called the expectation maximization algorithm. And today I'm mostly going to give you a uh, intuitive high level uh, introduction to expectation maximization. And then in next week's lecture on Monday, we are going to go into it in a little bit more mathematical detail because we are going to not only use it, it's a very useful algorithm on its own, but we're also going to use it to build deep learning models. We're going to use it as a stepping stone to create a certain type of deep learning model that's very interesting. So just to say today is the intuition, next week on Monday is the math, and um, we are going to build on this. So uh, I guess this is the most important part of today's lecture. Let's start with the review. Let's start with this famous normal distribution. And maybe let's start with the question of why it's so useful and why it occurs so often. 
there's one reason why, which I haven't included in the slide, something called the central limit theorem, which says that if you have a, a sequence of samples from some probability distribution, doesn't matter which probability distribution, could be a coin flip, could be a dice throw, could be anything, do you sample f uh, from it independently uh, from the same distribution over and over and over again? You take the sum of those samples, the sum is going to converge towards a normal distribution. It's going to look like this. So if I flip a coin, and if I sum how often I see heads, uh, as the number of coin flips increases, my distribution is going to look like this. If you've ever, that's a binomial distribution that I'm describing. If you've ever done that in any kind of statistics, you will know that for high parameter values, it does look like this. And that's true for any distribution. So that's the central limit theorem. So that's one reason why we see a lot of uh, normal distributions, because anything, any process where you sum things, where things accumulate through summing, uh, it will, uh, the distribution, resulting distribution will eventually look like this. But there's another side to the story, which I want to talk uh, more about today which is the question why we like it so much and why we like it as a building block so much, why we use it so much. Obviously, if these things occur a lot, then it makes sense to use it a lot. But as I said before, in machine learning, we don't really care that much whether our models are actually true. We care whether they work or not. Uh, and I think in that sense, the um, normal distribution has something special or something very useful. Uh, which is that it has a very definite scale. I talked about this before when I said that if I look at income distribution, which is very much not normally distributed, income doesn't have a very definite scale. So if I pick a random person here and they say they might have a, a yearly income of 10 k, uh, 10,000 euros, then I can find somebody probably in this building who has an income yearly income of 100,000. And I can probably find a couple of people in this city who have a yearly income of a million. I can probably find somebody in the Netherlands who has a yearly income of 10 million, thousand euros, uh, 10 million euros. Uh, somebody in Europe with 100 million, probably a billion. And in the world there might be somebody, well that's probably stretching it, but there might be somebody who makes 10 billion a year. Um, so what I'm saying is there's no definite scale, there's no definite number that is very typical, uh, well there's a definite number that is typical for income distribution, but there are always very wide exceptions that are many numbers of magnitude out of that range. And for the normal distribution that is not true. If you think of uh, heights, and I gave this example before, but just to reiterate, if you think of people's heights, most people uh, in the Netherlands, I guess, well, most men in the Netherlands have a height of about um, 175 centimeters. So that's the mean, and there's a little deviation around that both sides, so you might go to uh, 2 meters, and 2 meters 10, and 150, and maybe 145, but that's it. There is no extension to these wide orders of magnitude uh, leaps and bounds. So you will never find somebody who is 4 meters or 5 meters tall. Not even in the whole world, not even in 100 worlds, it's just not going to happen. So it's very different from what we saw with the income distribution. And what you can say is that a, a normal distribution has a fixed scale. So for instance, in between two, uh, two standard deviations of the mean, you'll see I think it's 67% uh, of the data, 67% uh, of the probability mass will fall in that range. And with every step further you move away from the, um, from the mean, the probability decays exponentially. Uh, so at some point the probability has decayed by half. If you take another step, the probability will decay by half again, and by half again, and by half again. And will go to zero very quickly. So that's what I mean by a probability distribution with a very definite scale. It has a definite range where almost everybody that you are go ever going to see uh, fits. Uh, mathematically, it can be a little bit uh, daunting, a little bit imposing. This is the, this is the uh, formula for the 
probability density function of the normal distribution in one dimension, so the this guy, this blue line. Uh, so the first thing I wanted to do was to uh, go through this to show you where this comes from, how we how we construct this uh, this formula, to show you hopefully firstly that it's not uh, not as scary as it looks once you get into it, once you start figuring out what all the components are and how uh, they end up where they are. And secondly, to highlight some of the properties of the uh, normal distribution. So the first thing I say, I said, in order to uh, to get this distribution with a definite scale, what you need is that the tails, the sides of this distribution that go off in one direction and off in the other direction, they need to be, uh, they need to decay exponentially. So, or, or at least, at least exponentially. So for every step. Uh, well, there needs to be a fixed distance that you go to have it. So I've uh, put a plot of the, an exponential, exponentially decaying function in blue. It's the simplest exponentially decaying function there is. It's just e, this number, 2.7 something, to the power of minus x. And you see here in the blue line that sort of goes to zero as exponential, exponentially decaying functions tend to do. And what that means is that um, there's a certain step, I guess it's about one, a little bit, uh, little bit below one. Uh, if you move a step, let's say 0 0.7 to the right, the value halves. And if you move 0 0.7 again to the right, the value halves again, and then halves again, and then halves again. So even after a few steps, you're already, uh, well, after 10 steps, you're already at a probability of 1 in 1,000. After 20 steps, you are already at a probability of 1 in 1 million. And after 30 steps, you are already at a probability of 1 in 1 billion. And that's what we mean by exponential decay. That a very limited, very normal number of steps will get you so close to zero that the probability, uh, probability density is basically zero for any practical purposes. Uh, but we can do one better. We can go squared exponentially, so we square x first and then take the, uh, the expo uh, do the exponential decay. And that has two benefits. Firstly, well, it has a couple of benefits. Firstly, that it decays even quicker, so you get even more of this definite scale. Um, secondly, that it has this inflection point, which I'm gonna talk about later. And thirdly, that you can, um, uh, it doesn't sort of shoot up to, uh, or doesn't um, how to say this? Uh, you get a nice flat bit at the top, basically. So if you look at what happens at zero, the uh, tangent there is also zero, so it flattens out at the top. And if you take the same value for negative x, it you get a nice bell shape, which is a little bonus. And the other thing, um, yeah, which I said earlier already, is that you get what are called inflection points, where here it's uh, decaying, and at every step it starts decaying even faster and faster and faster. So not only is it uh, is the function getting less and less and less, it's also getting less and less faster, until somewhere around this point where it starts getting less and less and less slower. And here the decay slows down uh, well, and, and in the direction of infinity, the decay just keeps slowing down. And the same thing here, that's called an inflection point. And it's where the derivative has a peak. So here you have the derivative of the uh, function y to the power of minus x squared. And you can see that it peaks right about where the uh, inflection point is. And these inflection points are a good indication, a good measure of the scale of this normal distribution. If we want to say, well, this, the range that sort of defines this probability distribution that gives me the values that I'm most likely to see, uh, I can pick the range between these two inflection points. And that will give me, um, uh, well, it's, it's in a certain sense slightly arbitrary, but that's the point where the, um, 
probability density starts decaying slower and slower and slower, so that makes sense. So the first thing we do, this is not a probability density function yet, by the way, this is just a function, and all we've said so far is that we want it to be super exponentially decaying in that direction and in that direction. So what we're going to say now, since we're defining a standard form of this distribution, we can say that we want these inflection points to be at plus one and negative one. So that the characteristic range for the distribution we're defining now is between minus one and plus one. That's very easy to do. You just put a little one half in front of this. Uh, I won't go into it, but if you work out the derivative and you work out where it's zero, uh, so you work out where it peaks, uh, then for this function it peaks at minus one and plus one. So now the characteristic range for this function where we are most likely to see, uh, uh, yeah, where most of the, the probability mass, it's not a probability density function yet, where, but where most of the mass ends up is in this area and we call that the characteristic range for this function. So this is already almost a probability, uh, this is already almost a normal distribution. And the function looks a lot less intimidating and a lot less scary than the one we saw earlier. So this is most of the work done already and it just looks like this. Uh, but we don't actually have control over the shape yet. We can't fit this to anything because we don't have any parameters that allow us to control the shape of this function. So that's what we're going to introduce now. Uh, firstly, we want to control how wide it is. So if we have some distribution where we want the characteristic range to be between minus two and plus two, then we need to scale it out a little bit. And if you want to scale a function, so if you want to make it wider, you can take the input and divide it by how much wider you want it to be. So if I want it to be twice as wide, I take the input x and I put a multiplier of one half before it. If I want, to be, want it to be five times as wide, I take the input x and I put a multiplier of uh, one over five in front of it. So that ends up inside the square and then we take it out of the square so this would be one over 25. And that's the variance that allows us to scale out this distribution as much as we like. Same thing if we want the center, the mean, to be somewhere else on this line. We take a look at the input and um, basically think of it like this. Instead of shifting the function to the right, we shift the coordinates to the left. So instead of adding something to the function, uh, which would scale it up as well, so we don't want that, we subtract something from x. We shift the coordinates to the right, uh, to the left. So it looks like this. It's just the function we saw earlier, except that x has now become x minus mu. Uh, so we subtract it from x, which moves everything to the right, and mu now becomes, uh, I think I put it at two, I don't remember, for this plot, but uh, mu is now scaled. So this is already starting to look a lot like a normal distribution. The only thing we haven't done yet is actually made it a probability density function. So probability density function is something that sums over the entire uh, domain. If you integrate over the entire domain, the area under the whole function needs to be one. And that's not the case yet, uh, but it is a finite value. If you do this integration for this value, for this uh, function, you get some finite value let's call that z, which means that if you take this function, let's call that f, and you multiply it by one over z at every point along this line, you just divide it by z, then it's going to sum to one. So you just divide by the total sum of this function and then it's going to sum to one. And I won't, um, subject you to that kind of level of, uh, of calculus and integration. To be honest, I'm not sure I could actually do it myself at this point, although I could look it up. But this is what it works out as. 
if you do the integration for this function, you get apparently the value, the square root of 2 pi times uh, squared sigma. So if you divide by that, then your function is normalized and it becomes a probability density function. And it looks, uh, well, becomes a little, less, a little bit less tall. And that gives us the normal distribution. Like this. Just a little bit of notation. If we refer to the probability density function, so that line that I just showed you of a normal distribution, we write it like this the n, the probability of x, given its these parameters, mu and sigma, the mean and the variance. Uh, sometimes you see it parameterized by the standard deviation instead of the um, mean, which just means you take sigma squared to be a symbol. Here we take sigma to be a symbol. You can also take sigma squared to be a symbol, and then that's the parameter of your normal distribution. doesn't really matter, so I went with variance to make it a bit simpler. So this is uh, how we refer to this probability density function. Uh, but you can do two things with the probability distribution. You can compute the probability of some outcome. You can also sample from it. We can sample from any given probability distribution. This should be a lowercase sigma. And if we have a random variable that is distributed according to a normal distribution, we write it like this. So if there's no conditional bar with the x in front of it, then it refers to distribution as a, as a concept, as it were. It refers to a specific distribution, and x can be distributed according that, to that distribution, and we can sample from that distribution. That was in one dimension. But we can also do a normal distribution in more than one dimension, so-called multivariate normal distribution. Multivariate just means more than one variable, and univariate means one variable. And then it looks like this, again, pretty scary, although we should now start seeing some parts, how some parts fit together, so this is the basic probability density function, and this is just a normalization constant, which doesn't depend on x, so this is just a constant. Uh, but it pays to go through this uh, step by step, just to see how it works. Uh, so we start again with this idea that we want a function that decays exponentially. But now we want a function that decays exponentially in all directions. So here we have a two-dimensional space with, a, the, with an origin, so a point where everything is zero. And we just say the probability density of this point decays with its distance to the origin. So the bigger some video. The bigger this distance is, the more it decays. So that's just what we're seeing here. We take the distance of x to the origin, the length of this vector, and we add it to one of these um, exponential functions. And actually here we're taking the we're not taking the exponential the squared exponential. Oh, we are, sorry, yes. So we take this distance, we square it, and then we add it to this ne exponential negative function. So this refers to the square of the distance. Uh, and the squ um, If you remember, the distance is just the square root of the dot product of, well, let's call this x, So that's the distance to the origin, or the magnitude of a vector. It's just the square root. It's just the square root of the dot product. So that cancels out with this square here. And what we get is just the exponential times the dot product of x. And I'm doing two steps here. I've also added this 1 half, which we added in the previous step. In the previous step, this, this helped us put the inflection points on minus 1 and plus 1. In this step, we get a kind of inflection circle. So the point where inside of which is most of the, uh, the interesting stuff is most of the high probability stuff. 
and the one half ensures that that is the what we call the bi-unit circle, so the circle that crosses one on this side and minus one on that side. So now we have an exponentially decaying function in all directions, uh, which has most of its probability mass or most of its mass inside this uh, bi-unit circle. Uh, and this time, let's do the uh, normalization first. So we integrate over this in all directions. You can do that. You can do integration in, in two dimensions. I won't go into it. And you end up with this normalization constant, this here. Square root of 2 pi to the power of d. So you just divide the whole thing by that, and then you get something that sums to 1 if you integrate over the whole plane. And now all we need to do is make sure that we can parameterize this, that we can shift the mean to any place we want and that we can shift, we can control the shape of this circle inside of which most of the probability mass falls. And I've showed you this before, this trick that you can define how you want to do that with a, um, uh, an affine function. So if this is our standard normal distribution that we've just defined, this is some point of density, and this is the distribution that we're actually interested in. So let's say we want a distribution with its mean here, and we want most of the probability mass to fall inside of this ellipse. Not a circle, but an ellipse. And then we're interested in the function that gives us the probability density of this blue point. Well, we can define a transformation from this by unit circle to this ellipse, we define that by one matrix and one translation vector. So you multiply x by the mat uh, matrix by x and add the translation vector. Here x is a random variable. So we sample a random variable from this distribution, sample a point from this distribution. Let's say we end up at the blue point. We multiply the point by x and add the translation vector and then we end up with this. Uh, the trick that we're going to use now is that if we have a probability density function for this, instead of trying to work out what the probability density function for this is, we can transform everything back. So if you want to know the probability density of the blue point under the orange distribution, we just transform the whole thing back. We uh, as it were, change the coordinates so that everything is transformed, so the, uh, the thing is rotated a little bit and then shrunken along the axis so that we end up here, and then we compute the probability density of this point under this one. And so long as we are careful to do this, so here we have a probability density function Px, could be anything in this case, in this drawing, it's a normal distribution, but it could be anything. This works for anything. Then the probability density of x under q, this uh, transformed one, is, forget about this x, I don't know. Oh, that's, a, oh, that's confusing. That's not an x, but that's a time symbol. Um, is the probability density of the back transformed blue point under p? except that since we're dealing with probability densities and this, uh, this transformation may blow up space, we need to make sure that the probability density function stays normalized. Luckily, there's a function that expresses how much uh, a matrix blows up space, how much a matrix inflates things, which is called the matrix determinant. And you can look up how it's computed, it doesn't, ma doesn't really matter, it's just if I have a thing, let's say a square, uh, with surface area one, and I transform all the points in that square, I get a square with surface area one times the determinant of the matrix. So how much it increases volume or uh, surface area uh, is, is indicated by the determinant. So for the backwards transformation, I need to multiply by the inverse, by one over the determinant to keep the probability density normalized to one. So if we use this trick, we can just, bit of math here, uh, basically uh, uh, take this uh, 
standard normal that we defined earlier. Let me show you this standard normal. And we want to um, apply one of these affine transformations to it. So we back transform x by the inverse of a plus, uh, ax plus t, which looks like this. The transformation here is defined by a and mu. Oh, let me write my mu the wrong way around. A and mu, so our translation vector is mu because that's just going to become the, the mean. So we uh, transform x back to this uh, standard normal coordinate system, the coordinate system where we have our standard normal distribution. That's just this. And then we need to make sure to transform by the inverse of the determinant of the matrix to keep the probability density normalized. Uh, this is a little trickery, so if you take the uh, Uh, the determinant of A uh, times A is equal to the determinant of A times the determinant of A, which is equal, and if you transpose A, then the determinant stays the same, so this value here, with just a bit of clever rewriting, is the same as this value here. Uh, and with that square, we can now move it into the uh, square on the right. And what we're doing on the right here, we are moving the transpose inside the brackets. So that in the middle we get the inverse of A transposed times the inverse of A again, and U minus X on both sides. And U minus X is just the uh, mean centered value of the, uh, of the data. Um, and then with a little bit more trickery, we can move around the transpose and the A, oh sorry, the transpose and the inverse, and we end up with this. And if you just look at the, uh, uh, the inverse goes over both A's, by the way, there should be brackets around this. If you look at the properties of uh, the transpose and the inverse on Wikipedia, you'll find that these are just basic properties that allow you to do this. So this is just some little bit of rewriting that's allowed. So we get this. And then, as I've said before, if you do this trick with this uh, affine transformation, the resulting probability density, the resulting normal distribution, has a sigma of A times A transpose. That's the covariance matrix of the resulting distribution, which we now see here that with a little bit of rewriting you can do that. So if this is all, if you're not quite following along, just remember we're doing the same thing we did earlier. We define a standard normal distribution and then we tra uh, transform it to shift the mean and to reshape the uh, size of the, the characteristic area where most of the mass falls, which gives us this. Uh, and just to show you the final picture, that looks like this. So we have a little bit of a flattened uh, ellipse now where most of the probability mass ends up. And just to finish the notation, we refer to the probability density x as mu sigma, as n uh, mu sigma. And if we sample from this, then we, <coughs> we get a normal distribution distributed according to this. Um, so like I said, you can sample from a normal distribution. How do you do that? It's worth knowing. So if you sample from a standard normal distribution in one, one dimension, there's usually just a, a function for that. In this case, numpy has a random.randn, which I agree is a little bit of a cop-out. I mean, obviously, there's functions to sample from all of these. Um, but this is just where I'd like to start. So this uses some algorithm called the Box-Muller transform doesn't really matter, but let's assume you can sample from a, varied, uh, from a univariate standard normal distribution, so 1D standard normal. How do you turn that into a sample of these guys? So firstly, we, use this, we can just use this transformation to sample from a 
any univariate normal distribution by just multiplying by the variance. This should be a lowercase sigma again. Multiply by the variance and add the mean. Uh, and so we sample, sorry, we sample x first from this distribution. We assume we have this. Then you apply this transformation and then you get something distributed according to this distribution. For a multivariate normal, if you want a multivariate normal uh, vector, so this would uh, the result of this would be a random vector in d dimensions, you can just get this sample by sampling d times from this distribution and stacking the results in a vector. That's just uh, gives you a sample from this distribution, and then you can sample from this distribution by taking a sample from this one and again applying this affine transformation. You just have to make sure if you want, uh, if you have a predetermined sigma that you want, predetermined covariance matrix, you need to decompose it before you can, uh, you need to decompose it into two A's, let's call the, uh, let's call the Holesky, dis Holesky decomposition. Um, but you can do this, you can just decompose it like this and then sample from this distribution and apply this affine transform. You get a standard, uh, you get a, any normally distributed sample you want. So that's pretty much all I wanted to say for now or I wanted to repeat about normal distributions. Uh, the second thing I wanted to discuss a little bit more in depth is the idea of this maximum likelihood principle. And the maximum likelihood principle is simply a definition of saying what makes a good fit for a probability distribution. What constitutes a probability distribution that fits my data well. If I have some data and I have some shape of probability distribution that I would want to apply to it, which one should I choose? So I have some generic probability distribution P and I have some data X. Could be one vector, could be a sequence of vectors. And I have some uh, theta which parameterizes my probability distribution. So it could be the mean and the variance of a normal distribution. Which theta should I pick? And this is what the maximum likelihood principle says. You should pick your probability distribution such that the probability of seeing your data or the probability density of seeing your data given this theta is as high as possible. This is what you should maximize. This is a sort of... Uh, Frequentist approach. You remember I talked about the differences between Bayesians and frequentists earlier. This is a very frequentist approach, um, which we don't really care about in machine learning. It's also a simple approach that scales quite well, usually to large data. And that's what we, uh, something we do care about in machine learning. So it's a good starting point, at least, to talk about fitting probability distributions. How do we find the parameters given some data? And what we usually take, uh, usually do is we uh, take the logarithm of p uh, x given theta. This is the, uh, this function, uh, this quantity as a function of theta is called the likelihood. We usually take the logarithm of the likelihood because um, things work out easier that way. As you'll see, most of these uh, probability density functions have a much simpler form if you put a logarithm in front of it. If you know the, if you think of the function of the logarithm, which looks a bit like this, you'll note that it's monotonic, uh, which means it just, it only increases, it doesn't go down. Uh, so the maximum of this function is the same as the maximum of this function. Uh, so that's called the log likelihood. Uh, not the score, ignore this, that's wrong. I'll fix that later. Uh, oh, it's on this slide as well. Uh, so forget about this, don't call it the score, call it the log likelihood. And there's this um, 
mapping to what we've been doing already. So we have this loss function, right? And a loss function is what we minimize to fit our machine learning model to data. And now we have this log likely func likelihood function, which is what we want to maximize to fit our probability to fit a probability distribution to data. So it's a very similar, very similar approach. Uh, the score, incidentally, is the derivative of the log likelihood. That's uh, um, and I think this is a little bit of math coming up, and I'm running a little bit late. So I recommend we uh, have a break now, it's about 15 minutes, and then we have a look at applying this maximum likelihood principle to finding the mean of a normal distribution, given some data. So we'll restart at uh, 10. All right, welcome back. Have a seat. Um, before we go back to the maximum likelihood, let me just have another crack at this slide. I don't. Uh, I got some questions about this in the break, and I don't think I quite explained what the idea was here. So let me just re, uh, reiterate this. The idea here is that we've defined a normal distribution, standard normal distribution, for which all of the uh, or the, the uh, characteristic, the, the majority of the probability mass is inside what we call a unit circle, uh, by unit circle. So that's the circle that crosses the points plus one and minus one on both axes. And we've made sure to normalize it so that it actually sums to one if you integrate. And now what we want to do is we want to, uh, let's say we have some data or we have some place where we want, we want the uh, probability distribution to end up, we want to move this around to where we want, want it to end up. So we want to put the mean, uh, not on zero, but on, let's say, the mean of our data, or the mean where we want most of the points to be, depending on how we're going to use the distribution. And we want this circle also to cover most of the data or to cover most of the points that we're interested in. Uh, so let's say the mean is some point somewhere that we're interested in. And what we want the circle to cover is some kind of ellipse. What we can do is we can define a uh, linear transformation that turns this circle into this ellipse. That's just, we just have to find the right A to do that. So let's assume we have that. So we define this ellipse by two parameters, A and T. And then we basically have what we want. We can sample from this, multiply it by X, and end up here. Uh, the question is, what happens to the probability density function? How can we compute that? So what's the probability density function of this? Let's say we have a point here. And we want to know the probability density of that point. What we can do is we can go the other way. We can transform this point back the other way. And we might end up somewhere here. And we can compute the probability density of this point under our standard normal distribution. We call that Px. This works for any probability density function, not just the normal distribution. So that's why I call it Px. And then we can basically say that if this is Q, the probability density of this point is the same as the probability density of this point, except that we have to correct for how much the matrix blows up the space. So if the matrix inflates space, we need to reduce the probability density function to make sure it sums to one. So basically what we get is the probability density of X under Q is the probability density of x transformed back. I've called it t here. Transformed back to this space. And then we need to div divide by the determinant of the matrix, 
so that the probability density uh, stays the same. So that's what happened here. Uh, is it x minus t or x plus t? It's probably x minus t, I imagine. So yeah, you're right, this is probably wrong. Um, but I can't do it in my head, so I'll have a look. Uh, there's a few mistakes in the slides, so I'll go over that today and you can check the slides when the fixed version is uh, uploaded. Um, but anyway, that's the basic principle of what this slide was meant to, uh, meant to express. Um, and in a way, this is what we did in the univariate case as well, right? We defined a normal distribution and then we squeezed it and then we moved it basically by moving the coordinates back. So, back to this maximum likelihood thing. Uh, I seem to be moving around between the logarithm and the natural logarithm. The base of the logarithm doesn't matter very much, except that we have this uh, exponent e in the normal distribution, so it makes sense to use the natural logarithm, so they cancel out. So if we have some x, capital X, which represents our whole data set, so we have some number of independent samples from some let's say a normal distribution, we call that capital X, then the probability density of X is simply the product of all the probability densities of the individual points because they've been independently sampled. So we can just multiply the probabilities and we can also multiply the probability densities. So this is our optimization problem. We want to maximize the parameters so that this value is maximized. Uh, we want to choose the parameters so that this value is maximized. Uh, and if you have a, a product in a logarithm, just to make this uh, clear, because we're going to use this a lot, just to remind you, if you have some logarithm, let's say a natural logarithm, A times B, <coughs> uh, that splits up into the sum of the individual logarithms. So if you have a product of lots of things, like this big uh, pi here, capital pi, then that splits up into the sum sigma of the individual logarithms. We're just doing this, but with the big, uh, big sigma and the big pi. So then we fill in our normal distribution, our big impressive looking function. Uh, so the uh, ln, I've not used brackets, but it goes over the whole thing here. And we're looking for the mu and sigma that maximize this quantity, summed over all of our data points. And now we can see why we use the logarithm in the next step. No? Uh, oh yeah. Uh, so we get the logarithm of this constant, whatever it is, we, this disappears in a minute. Uh, so here we use the same thing again, right? The logarithm of this times the logarithm of this is the logarithm of this, sorry. The logarithm of this times this is the logarithm of this plus the logarithm of that. So there we get a logarithm with an exponential right in it. These cancel out against, the, against each other. So we get this plus this. Uh, and this, all of this falls inside the summation. <coughs> so when we start taking, uh, oh yeah, and obviously we want to find the maximum, so we take the derivative and we set the derivative equal to zero. So we take the derivative of this thing with respect to mu, then we end up uh, applying the sum rule. We end up with this with respect to mu. And then we see that this thing, this term here disappears because it doesn't depend on mu. So we end up with only the term on the right. <coughs> and here's a little trick. If you're using, if you're deriving the gradient and your intention is to do this trick of setting it equal to zero, so we're not gonna use this for gradient descent, we're going to set it equal to zero and solve it. 
If you're doing that, then you can immediately remove any constant multiplier. So this is a multiplier that doesn't depend on mu. We can just throw that away. Because once we set it to zero, that's going to disappear anyway. <coughs> so ultimately, what we end up with in this term, all that's left over is x minus mu squared. Uh, and if you apply the chain rule here, then the 2 goes out in front, cancels out against the half. <coughs> and the derivative of this is just 1. <coughs> or is it minus 1? Oh, there might be a minus error here somewhere. Anyway, you end up with this. And if you set this equal to 0, uh, this moves to the other side, and you get 1 over the sum of x. So you just get the mean. So a lot of, a lot of math, a lot of uh, stuff. The only real takeaway here uh, is that if you take this maximum likelihood principle and you work out which uh, values of the parameters give you the maximum likelihood value, give you the maximum likelihood fit over your data, after you do all the math, you end up with very natural and very familiar solutions like this, like the mean. And you can do the same thing for the standard deviation, then you end up with the uh, biased estimator of the standard deviation, so the version that divides by n, not by n minus 1. So it doesn't always give you the uh, best thing to use, but it always gives you a pretty good thing, a pretty good estimator to use. So that's the basic maximum likelihood principle. Another example is uh, something we've seen already in linear regression. This really, this really shows the connection between maximum likelihood and some of these loss functions that we've been using. So this is basic linear, uh, least squares linear regression, right? We have a function that predicts an output for us. We see how wrong it is. Um, uh, compute these residuals, how wrong it is for each data point. And we sum the squares of the residuals as a loss function. That's what we've been doing so far. But now let's model this as a probability distribution. So we have our output y. And we have some input x. So x is on this axis. Some random variable x. We don't really care how x is distributed. So we don't care how points are distributed along this line. We only care about the relation between these points and this. So x has some distribution we don't care about we apply to x our linear transformation with the two parameters w and b. And then we apply some error. And the error, which is uh, normally distributed, is basically we, uh, the distribution from which we assume the residuals are added. So we assume that our model is correct. Our model does actually is actually generated by a, a linear function. But there's some noise process or some measurement error or something that means that what we're actually seeing is a corrupted version of the true model and the corruption is a uh, normally distributed uh, quantity which we'll call E and again X uh, is an unknown has an unknown distribution doesn't really matter we uh, it, it falls out of the math so it, uh, we don't need to know how X is distributed so if we do that, we end up with this problem. So we have given some x and two parameters, we get a y. And we want to maximize the parameters to uh, maximize the likelihood of our data. So we call the individual data points xi and yi. And uh, this is basically what we just, uh, what we just defined. So our points yi given the x's, so the x's are given, uh, then y is a, uh, ends up here. So if you have x, you can compute the mean value of y by following this model, by uh, implementing this linear function. And then you deviate from that by some sigma in a normally, dis uh, normally distributed way. And now we want to maximize this function, so we take the logarithm and we do the product. We split all this out, we get a 
big scary looking function again. Uh, the logarithm cancels lots of stuff out. So uh, what's happened here? Basically this whole thing doesn't depend on w or b. So this whole thing disappears. This one cancels out against the logarithm. So we end up with this. Uh, here again we have a constant multiplier, sigma, which doesn't depend on the quantities we want to maximize. So we can just, if we remove this sigma or uh, set it to one, then the maximum doesn't change. So we can just turn this into this, get rid of the sigma, move the one half in front of the uh, summation. And what we end, oh yeah, and then we maximize the negative of this, which is this, uh, the same as minimizing the same quantity but removing the negative, the minus in front. So this is the same as minimizing this function. Does this look familiar? This is basically our least squares loss function that we've been using so far. So what we've done here, just to, uh, if you got lost along the way, we started with a maximum likelihood objective, saying we have this probability distribution and we want to fit it uh, to maximize the probability of our data. And we ended up with what we've been doing all the time already, which is our least squares loss function. In other words, least squares loss function follow the least squares loss function follows directly from a normality assumption on our residuals or uh, more specifically the, uh, uh, what's it, it's a slightly more uh, broad uh, assumption, but basically we assume that our residuals are normally distributed. And if we then do a maximum likelihood fit, it follows that we should use the least squares loss function. And that tells us also why uh, least squares regression is so sensitive to outliers. Because as I said before, the normal distribution, so this is our least squares line, the normal distribution defines a uh, finite scale, a definite scale. So this is the sort of distribution we are assuming for our, uh, our residuals. If you end up with something, if you have one residual, one outlier, which is very far outside this uh, characteristic scale of your normal distribution, then this gets lots and lots of power. And this really pulls very hard on the line because the normal distribution has this definite scale that expects all the errors to fall in this, uh, this range. So because of this normality uh, assumption, least squares regression is quite sensitive to outliers. And as I said in one of the previous lectures, if you have outliers that are part of your data, check your model for assumptions of normality. And they can be quite sneaky, right? The least squares, this doesn't look like something that assumes a normal distribution anywhere, or even any distribution anywhere, but it's still in there. So, that's all I wanted to say about maximum likelihood fitting models. All right, I'm going to have to rush through this a little bit, uh, but we come back to it next Monday, so that's okay. So we're going to do quite a high-level intuitive, uh, intuitive explanation of the EM algorithm and Gaussian mixture models. Uh, so this is what I showed you in the introductory lecture. These are the grades for this course from last year. And it's not quite a uh, normal distribution, as you can see, which does happen. So you, one thing that might happen is that uh, people are from different, uh, different masters or different bachelors, I mean, and uh, have different backgrounds. So computer science students are better at some things than uh, IMM students and vice versa. Uh, so they might score differently depending on uh, what the, the course, what a particular course uh, caters to. Uh, 
So you might get students from one background here, one background here, and then, well, something happens here. Uh, these are the people probably who thought halfway, well, I'll try again next year. Uh, so, but um, the basic idea is this, this doesn't look like one normal distribution, but it might look like a combination of three different normal distributions. That's what we call a Gaussian mixture model, which we define like this. We pick three normal distributions. I mean, three is arbitrary. You can pick any number, but I'll do it for three to keep, it, uh, keep the explanation simple. So we pick three components, three normal distributions, and we give them all weights, W1, W2, and W3. And we make sure that the weights sum to one. So these are kind of probabilities to each assigned to each component. And if you want to sample from this Gaussian mixture model, then you just sample one of these weights according to this distribution, and then you sample a point from component I, from the component you just picked. So that looks like this. If you have three, and I'll do it in the univariate case just to uh, keep it simple. If you have three distributions like this, and they're weighted, so I gave the red a very small weight, the green quite a high weight, and the uh, blue I gave a medium weight, then the probability density function that you end up with if you sum all of them together, if you combine all of them, if you, sorry, if you sample in this way, is just the densities summed by these weights. So what you see here uh, is the sum of the probability densities for each component weighted by this weight. So you see here in this area both the green and the blue have very low, or we are very much in the tail end of this uh, blue and the green, but we're right on the mean of the red. So the red has a very high probability density, even though the red has a very low weight, I think it was uh, 0 0.1 for the weight of the red. We're right on the mean of the red, so the contribution of the green and the blue is very low here. As we go towards the mean of the green, we can start to see the contribution of the green get higher and higher, and the red completely disappears here, right? And then here, somewhere here, the blue takes over. So this looks like a weird shape, but remember this is just a blue here, it's just a normal distribution, but because we're summing them it looks sort of hunched over this, uh, spread over this green distribution. And this is just, uh, this is all we're doing. We're just creating a mixture of uh, probability density functions by some weight. And then we get a very non-normal looking distribution with peaks in different places. So that's a very useful distribution to use if your data doesn't look normal but it looks like it might be normal locally, as it were. As it looks like it might be a combination of normal distributions. And in two dimensions it, uh, well, it can look a bit like this. So basically, we just have uh, uh, three distributions here, red, green, and blue. And what I've done, of, uh, what this picture shows is these, uh, these are ellipses that contain most of the probability distribution. I can't really draw a picture like this in two dimensions. But it, it generalizes very naturally to more than one dimension. So that's the Gaussian mixture model. That's all it is. Uh, the problem happens when we try to fit a Gaussian mixture model. Because if we apply this maximum likelihood principle, what happens is that we want to maximize these three things, the parameters, the weights of our components, the means of our components, and the covariances of our components. So this is in the multivariate case, more than one dimension. We want to maximize the probability density the probability density of the uh, data under our model. And what we see here is that we have a sum inside of our logarithm. So we don't have A times B inside the logarithm. We have A plus B inside our logarithm. And that doesn't simplify to anything 
There's no rule that allows you to take this and turn it into something else. You are stuck with this sum inside your logarithm. So you can still take the derivative of this with respect to the parameters. Uh, you know, just apply the chain rule, chain rule the heck out of it. But it doesn't simplify. You don't get what we got earlier, that everything falls out and that everything disappears, and that this logarithm cancels out against all the exponentials in the normal distribution. You just end up with something that gets more and more complex. And you do get a gradient, but you can't set it equal to zero and get a closed form solution. You don't get, you cannot compute the optimal parameters under the maximum likelihood principle. All you get is a gradient. So you can use gradient descent, uh, and there are people doing that. Uh, but there's actually a, a nicer way of doing that, of doing this, of fitting these models, and of getting around this problem that you can't get a closed form solution. And that's called the EM algorithm. And it behaves a lot like something we've already seen in the introductory lecture called the k-means algorithm. So just to get your minds in the right, uh, in the right place, let's look at the k-means algorithm first. Remind ourselves what that looks like. Uh, remember k-means is a clustering algorithm. So we have a data set and we want to cluster it into, in this case, three clusters. We define each cluster by its midpoint, by its center point, the point of uh, center of mass, as it were. And we start with some random points. So we start with a random blue point here, random green point here, and random red point here. And then we assign all the points to the cluster for which the center point is nearest. The mean point is nearest. So all of these points are closest to the blue point, so they get colored blue. They become part of the blue cluster. These are all closest to the green point, so they become part of the green cluster. And these are all closest to the red mean, so they become part of the red cluster. Which is not a very good clustering because we've chosen these mean points randomly. But then once we have the clustering, we choose new mean points. So now the blue mean point becomes the mean of all the points we've just colored blue in the previous step. The new green point becomes the mean of all the points we've colored green in the previous step. And the new red point becomes the mean of all the points we've colored red in the previous step. So we get new mean points. And we repeat the step. We recolor the points. So here we see that uh, more points are now blue. These points are all colored blue because these points are now closest to the blue point. And then we do this again and again, and we iterate this. And as if by magic, the points converge to some very natural looking clusters for this data. Uh, so with k-means, it's very difficult to see why it should work, but it does work. And expectation maximization is a kind of uh, fancier version of k-means, which also allows us to show uh, probably in the next lecture, why this actually works, why this actually converges to a good solution. Just a little sidetrack, if you want to do this, but you only have distances for the points, so your points are not feature vectors, but they are anything over which you have a distance function, so they might be strings or they might be anything you have a distance function over, you can use an algorithm called k-medoids, which is a bit like uh, k-means, but the means aren't points in space, the means are points in your data set. So they are medoids. So instead of choosing the uh, mean here, when you recalculate the means uh, after coloring the points, you choose the point for a given cluster that is closest to all the other points. So you look, I have a blue cluster. I have to find a new center point for it, a medoid in this case. Uh, and then I look at all points in the cluster, which of the points has the shortest sum distance to all the other points. Uh, so the advantage is you can describe the uh, center points of your data, so, uh, center points of your clusters with points actually in your data, and then you only need a distance function. So it's a bit like this kernel trick we saw on Monday, uh, except for clustering instead of for classification. So that's called k-medoids if you ever uh, need something like that. <coughs> 
So let's look at this EM algorithm, which is an extension of k-means. Uh, and we're going to look at it mostly just from an intuitive point of view. I'm just going to describe what it does and how it works. Uh, so we initialize our components randomly. We just pick some uh, random, uh, random multivariate normal distributions. And we give them uniform weights, let's say. So we have three, uh, three components, and we give them each weight one-third. And then we do the same thing as k-means. We assign responsibilities to the points according to the components. So we basically uh, compute a number that tells us, I think, that probably this component was responsible for this point. Call that a responsibility. So I sort of uh, assume that my components that I've picked are correct. And given that those are correct, which component for, uh, for this particular point x, which component was most likely to have generated this point x? So if we go all the way back, if we have this, uh, this model here and I get a point here, then I'm almost certain that the red component generated that point, assuming that this model is actually what generated the data. If I see a point here, then I'm almost certain that the red point, that the red component generated that point. That's what we call the responsibility. So in that case, red had a very high responsibility for that particular point x. And I do that for all the points in my data set. And then I throw away my component parameters. And I fit new components. I fit new components to these, uh, to these points according to these soft responsibilities. So I um, should make that clear. In k-means, we assigned every point to a color. We assigned every point to a component. Here we get a soft distribution over components. So every component takes some responsibility for the point, but it varies. And in this case, we saw earlier the red point takes a lot of responsibility. The red component takes a lot of responsibility for the point, and the other two take very low responsibility. Uh, so let's look at that uh, more visually. Here we have our data. This is a famous uh, data set called the Old Geyser, uh, no, Old Faithful data set, which is a, a geyser in uh, Yellowstone Park. Anyway, we have a bunch of points, and we pick some random components to initialize our model. So these are multivariate normal distributions. And then we color our points by how much probability density is assigned relatively by one or, two, uh, by one or other of the components. And you see, as in k-means, that if the points are close to the component, they get colored by the color of that component. Here the points get colored red, here they get colored blue. But if points are sort of halfway between the two, then they get equal responsibility. So here you get a line of purple points, and they have uh, responsibility divided equally betwi between the two components. How do we compute this responsibility? It's very Straightforward. Here we see the uh, early mixture model again. So if we want to compute the responsibility for this point here, let's say 4.8 under these uh, components, we just take this bar here and we normalize over this. So the responsibility of the green component for this point is the size of this green bar divided by the total. Responsibility of the red point is the size of this red bar divided by the total. So it's just, uh, you can express this with uh, conditional uh, probability. So the responsibility of component Z for point X is just the probability that Z generated, uh, the, the probability of Z given X, the probability that Z generated X, summed over all the uh, all the conditional responsibilities. So going back, this is the one we ended up with the last time. We then throw away the components, and we fit new components to these colored points. So in this, when we're fitting this blue point, these very blue, uh, when we're fitting this blue component, these very blue points 
uh, contribute a lot to computing the mean and the variance and the covariance of this uh, of this distribution, and the red points contribute very little. So you get a weighted fit of a multivariate normal over your data set. And the same thing here. So we get new components, we recolor the points. And as you can see, if uh, you should look this distribution here uh, at the bottom, uh, as you can see slowly the red point starts taking less and less responsibility for the points in the bottom, and the blue component starts taking less and less responsibility for the points in the top. And eventually you end up with this after 20 iterations or so. So that's basically, in a, a nutshell, the expectation maximization algorithm for Gaussian mixture models. Uh, but it's not just an algorithm for Gaussian mixture models, it's a very generic algorithm. It's a, an algorithm for anything that you can phrase as a hidden variable model. So here we have a little graphical picture. We have our observed data X, and we assume that this data was generated from some hidden variable. In the component mixture model, somebody sampled first, for every data point, somebody sampled a component and then sampled from that component. That's how our data was generated, or we so we assume. But then they deleted which component every uh, point came from. So we don't get the complete data, we just get the points X. So X are the observed points, uh, Z are the hidden variables or the latent variables which is the parts of our model that we cannot observe and we need to infer. So if we knew Z, if we knew, if we had complete data, if we knew for every point what component it was sampled from, we could just do a, a very easy maximum likelihood fit. It would be no problem at all. So one question you can ask yourself is why don't we just uh, marginalize this out? Just include it in our model Say we have a complete data distribution, a joint data distribution, which uh, gives us the probabilities over X and Z together. And then we just sum over all possible values of Z so that it gets marginalized out and we get our, uh, complete da uh, our uh, data distribution over ob observed data. Uh, the problem here is that if we have two components here, then this, uh, Z is just uh, a choice between the two components for every data point. So for every data point we choose whether or not whether it came from the first component or from the second component. Uh, so this is a, uh, you could write that down as a binary vector of length n, where n, n is the number of data points. The problem is that if you have, if you do that in just two components and you have just 30 data points, um, this has a billion terms. There are a billion things to sum over because there are a billion different binary strings with 30 bits. So yes, you could do it like this. And that's a good starting point, but you have to figure out a way to get rid of these 30, uh, of these billion terms. Um, and we'll come back to that next week when we look into this uh, from a slightly different perspective in a way that will help us build uh, deep learning models on this. For now, we'll leave the description of the EAM algorithm at this. And I'll just briefly conclude by asking what the point of all of this is, where are we gonna use this? Um, and there are two main use cases for, uh, for fitting a Gaussian mixture model. The first is clustering, like the k-means algorithm. Once you fit, uh, Gaussian mixture model to your data, let's say this uh, uh, grade distribution from last year that we had, you get, uh, if it's a good fit, you get natural clusters in your data. You see the natural clusters in your data, every component is fit to some cluster in your data. So from this, uh, from this grade distribution, I could possibly get the two main types of students from last year's uh, from last year's course and they might correlate to a type of uh, uh, to, a, to a specific bachelor or to something else 
Uh, maybe they correlate to some other course that people are following that's taking up all their time. But it's a very good unsupervised way of looking at your data and finding natural clusters. Uh, so you can do fraud detection, you can do community detection, you can target treatments. So if I have, uh, well, again with the student example, if I split my data set into good students and bad students, then I have two types of people that I need to treat differently. The bad students I need to give a bit of extra help and I need to explain things more simply. Um, and the good students I need to <coughs> see if I can challenge them more and see if I can uh, give them a bit more challenging examples. And if I do one or the other for everybody, then I'm going to screw up because my uh, students who are finding things difficult might get more challenging examples. And the students who are, fi who are finding things easy might get, uh, students who are finding things easy uh, might get more and more explanations that they're not waiting for. So I can't do both treatments for the whole data set, but if I cluster first, then I can apply treatments more specifically, which works for marketing, which works for medicine. I can do this with patients and stuff like that. I can use clustering to break my uh, population up into groups that need to be treated differently. Uh, but they're all unsupervised methods. So you need to do this and then look at what you found, look at what you found, see if it makes sense, and then build on top of that. Um, you can also use this for classification because we uh, talked about this base classifier earlier which basically splits your data into points by class and then fits a probability model to each of these points. So if we have a ham class and a spam class, you fit a probability distribution to the ham points in the ham class, you fit a probability distribution to the points in the spam class. <coughs> and then <coughs> Sorry. And then when you want to classify, you just look at, for a new point, which of these two models gives the highest probability. And you can do that with a Gaussian mixture model as well. We've seen this for a uh, naive base. We've seen this for single distribution, single normal distributions. But you can, also do a, you can also fit a Gaussian mixture model to each class, which is very, very much not a naive base classifier because you get very... Uh, correlated features, but it allows you to do something like this. So here we have some points, uh, male and female, that we want to classify. And as you see, if you fit just one normal distribution, then the blue one has to sort of stretch to uh, cover all the blue points down here. And if you do this with a Gaussian mixture model for each class, of uh, three components, then the uh, yeah uh, the the model can distribute its probability mass much more neatly on top of the data, and here you would get sort of a decision boundary somewhere here, I guess. So that's another place where you can use expectation maximization uh, with Gaussian mixture models. So just to summarize what we've talked about today, we've talked about normal distributions. And these are very helpful building blocks for more complex distributions. We've talked about the maximum likelihood principle, which is a reasonable and simple way of fitting models. And often it turns out that when you work out, when you rewrite it or you work out what your uh, optimal solution is, your closed form for your optimal solution, it looks like something you already know. Then we talked about Gaussian mixture models, which are ways to combine uh, multiple Gaussians into a single probability distribution, which are very useful but very difficult to fit. And that's where we introduce the EM algorithm, which is a way to fit, in general, hidden, vari hidden variable models, of which Gaussian mixture models are a specific, uh, a specific version. Last slide. Next time, we are going to continue with EM. Uh, we're going to look at it from a slightly different perspective, which will tell us why it is guaranteed to converge, which it is, but to a local max maximum. And then we're going to have a look at uh, how EM can help us design deep neural network models, specifically a neural network model called the variational autoencoder, which is one of the more, more exciting models being used today, which can do some very cool stuff. <coughs>
that's next Monday. Uh, and this is all I had for today. So thank you for being here, and uh, I'll see you next week.